Hi y'all, I'm going to be putting off doing my video response to uh, Super Princess Tea Party's video on toxic masculinity because she made a video response and I would rather address that. So, uh, there. Hi there Super Princess Tea Party, thank you for the response. Let me rush to agree with the proposition that you can do everything right and still wind up being a victim. You can hide all of your goodies in a bank vault with armed guards and it can still get robbed and your shit could be taken. Entirely true. As I said to this lady a few years ago, 2013 actually, we were standing on a street corner and there was uh, one of those little pedestrian traffic lights, you know, the little red hand or the little white dude. Totally racist. And uh, it switches from the red hand to the white dude and she walks out just without paying attention to anything and there's this car that's running a red light, so I grab her shoulder and pull her back. And, uh, and, and she's like, oh, that was close. She didn't even say thank you, by the way. How rude. Anyway, the wry remark I, I made as I was walking off was, uh, you, having the right of way and being dead are not mutually exclusive propositions. So, uh, you know, you need to pay attention to that kind of stuff. I also want to correct a misunderstanding that you had. Um, I was not saying that I'm a current law enforcement officer in that section of the video. I was saying that at the time I was talking about, I was what I was thinking was that uh, I was a cop then. I am not now. I just don't want, to miss, I don't want anyone to uh, draw the wrong conclusion. I guess I could have done a better job of saying, hey, this is a flashback scene and this is what I was thinking at the time. And, and then put brackets at the end and said, oh, I've stopped thinking about this, I'm back to the present tense. But anyway, um, so there's that. Now, you, uh, you and I, I think, are largely agreed on safe spaces. If by safe space, one means a shelter where abuse victims, you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse, whatever it is, are there to be protected against their abusers, then fine. If it's on what's going on in the college campuses, not, not so much. Uh, rather manipulative. Okay, anyway, so I think we're largely agreed there. You agreed with my criticism of the stranger danger because it wasn't borne out by the data, but then you disagree with my claims about rape threats and what women face because the data you claim supports it. You're incorrect. By the way, you said you would link to the studies below and you didn't, but it's okay. It's not my first time at the rodeo. I know the literature. Um, so anyway, um, the, if you also mentioned that um, it sounded as though you were going to start saying that sounds a little bit like I was victim blaming when I'm talking about taking personal responsibility for what happens to one on one's life. But then you said, well, but at, at some level, everyone has a responsibility to see after their own affairs. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Men have the same concerns in the world uh, writ large that women do. I mean, we can be hurt. We're not supermen. Uh, we, can, we can contract diseases. We can be killed. You know, we have emotional problems that, that affect us. We cry. You know, all these types of things are true of men, too. The, the one is an issue of degree. Women are far more emotional, on average, than men are. And women, uh, unlike men, over-perceive dangers. So either, you know, even if the danger exists, I mean, there is a threat of rape that does exist, you over-perceive it. And then you couple that with confirmation bias, and you're likely to believe bullshit uh, numbers that you're given. Lies, damned lies, and statistics. I, um... In your last video, you said things that we don't have to worry about. Every room I walk into, without exception, even in my own home with my family and friends, when I walk into a room, I scan everyone's hands and their waistlines, without exception. Every road that I cross, every intersection I go through, I examine, I look for cross traffic. I do this every time, without failure, without violation. And that's because there is a threat that, that exists, and I'm acting consistent with the existence of that threat. And like a couple of years ago, this woman, uh, she's a feminist blogger named Blag Hag, talks about how she gets all these threats, and she's so scared, and if anybody ever found out where she lives, it'd be terrible, blah, 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 blah. And then she posts fucking pictures of her home address and street corner. Like, well, clearly you do not take seriously the supposed threats that you get. Your actions are inconsistent with the proposition that you were in mortal danger. In the same way that law enforcement officers on traffic stops, you know, oh, the most dangerous, is so dangerous, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then you look at their actions on the traffic stops, clearly they don't believe it. People who think that there is a mortal threat, potentially right before them, don't walk up and start doing one of these numbers. You know, looking back at the patrol car, oh, look at my pretty light bar. God, I love that pattern. Or, is that, is that my dash cam that's recording you know, this mortal threat that I'm not, I don't feel like I'm in? Uh, they wear these, they have bosses who make them wear these stupid baseball caps that have a bill, so when they look down, they can't see uh, you know, half of half of their field of view, uh, they can't see for half of their field of view because it's been cut out by the brim, by the brim of the cap. Their 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 actions are inconsistent with the proposition. But they'll go into court and tell you, well, this and that justifies this stop because of all the threats and the fear that we face. 
And so when I talk to sometimes cops, uh, sometimes cop supporters, uh, of which I'm one general, I'm, well, good cops, bad cops I hate and I hope they get killed, um, I really do think that corrupt cops should be subject to the death penalty. Sorry, you violate your oath, I think that you should be able to be put to death by a jury. Anyway, putting that off to the side. Um, the, uh, they'll bring up, do you know how often an officer is shot and killed on a traffic stop? Actually, yes, I do. It's about twice per year. Why do you ask? Because I actually do know the data. I, I, my concern over issues scales in proportion to the threat that actually exists, not my personal feelings, notwithstanding the fact that I have exchanged bullets with bad people. I have been stabbed by a bad person. In fact, he, you know, my blood is on his blade, and I'm thinking, my word, I wanted to, excuse me, sir, why have you put my blood on your blade? But I was un, unable to ask that question because he unfortunately contracted an acute case of lead poisoning, and we didn't get to talk about it, which was very sad for me. That does not license my going forward from that moment on, acting as though the threat is inflated beyond what it is. Yes, the threat exists. It is not overly present. It will occur. And, you know, that day that the dude pulled a knife on me, it was my unlucky day. Every, well, not every gunfight gun I've been in is uh, my unlucky day because I, I, I chose to take more, uh, more risky parts of the job. This does not license, my personal experience does not license uh, all these other propositions. My emotional state is not an indicator of reality. It's an indicator of what I feel. The data will answer the questions. And the data, uh, the data must, ha the, 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 the data have to be good in order to be able to address the questions. So, um, I'm going to argue by analogy on various statistics, because if I start talking about the rape statistics, feminists go, oh, no, 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 because when women, when you want to talk about women being raped, people lose their shit. When you talk about kids being abused, people lose their shit in rational conversation. As a Solicitor General of the United States, days once noted, uh, on child pornography, when the subject comes up, people, ca you cannot have a rational conversation. So I'll talk about a different subject and then argue by analogy. Earlier this year, or maybe last year, I was having a discussion on this channel about homicide statistics in Australia, because this is people love to bring up the Australia objection to gun rights in the United States. And going back to like 90, 1990, 91, 92, that kind of a time frame, their homicide rate in Australia was about 2.1. And last year, or the year, last year for which I had data, it was about 2.1. So it's exactly the same. What I failed to notice, notwithstanding my having done due diligence to look into the issue, is that uh, there was a note tacked on somewhere in, in, all these, in all the data reports that says, by the way, we count as homicide both homicide and non-homicide offenses. So a homicide offense does not require that anyone be killed in Australia. So if you're ever going to be murdered, uh, people, go to Australia because there you can be murdered and still live. So I guess socialized medicine has something going for it. <laughs> Keep you from... It is a fountain of youth. That is just a dishonest way to represent data, to say, these are homicide statistics. Note, uh, includes people who were never homicided. That happens in the United States. This is how, well, how long and well the termites here have dined. Even the FBI is now publishing data on rape that includes non-rape. And it, if, you, if you read through it, you'll find the footnote and it says, for the purposes of this crime alone, out of all possible crimes in the universe, this one is different. We are including uh, things that aren't rape to be counted as rape, well, you know, like attempts. Whatever else, whatever else is true uh, about rape and attempted rape, the one thing that an attempted rape is not is a rape. A failure to do a thing should not count as the completion of the success in doing that thing, except the FBI does it uh, because they need the numbers to be inflated uh, to fit the, the myth that people have. So a lot of the research uh, that gets bandied about is based off of work done by Mary Koss, who is a fraud. She is a liar. The way that you wind up be counting as a data point in Mary Koss's research is if Mary Koss wants you to count as a data point in Mary Koss's research. How are you excluded from uh, counting as a data point if Mary Koss doesn't want you to count as a data point in her research? She just defines you not to count as a data point in her research. She makes it up. Entirely. It is wholly dishonest. She is a fraud, a charlatan, a liar. Um, for example, women can't rape men. She denies that it's possible for a woman to rape a man. If a woman drugs a man, injects his penis so it gets an erection, 
and you know does all kinds of horrible things not rape why is that not rape because Mary Cost doesn't want that to count as rape and therefore she says it's obviously not rape it's inappropriate I mean it's rude don't, don't do that but it's not a sex offense it's just it, mm -mm, no kind of ways and indeed when asked the question her response was how could it, how could you even do it essentially there is if if he gets hard then clearly he wants it ladies presumably uh we should accept the, the reciprocal proposition that if, uh, if you get moist while being raped, it's because you really secretly wanted it, not because you're actually being raped and your biology does what your biology does, sometimes whether you want it to or not. So that's Mary Koss. Um, she oversamples uh, people who are likely to, to report, uh, people who are interested in uh, having a particular outcome. She doesn't do random samples. She is just a fraud. A complete, outright charlatan. So, there's that. And then some people try to rescue her research by adverting to the NCVS, as the, which does not say that one in four people are raped. The NCVS is uh, data that, data, supposed data that are collected, which no one checks on. It might sound harsh, but I am a data-driven thinker. You've got to have data, and you've got to be able to substantiate the data. Asking someone, were you raped, and the person saying yes, and the researcher going, I 100% believe you, it's impossible that you could be wrong, that counts, is not research. That is what the NCVS is. Whatever the people are, tell the, the people who ask the questions, the people who ask the questions just have to take it as true. They can't investigate, they can't look behind it, they just must accept it and report it. That is not research. Um, okay, so... Um, The uh, cops tend to overperceive dangers too, <clears throat> um, and cops are mostly men. So you might think, "Well, this is an, this is consistent with the proposition that um, there there aren't these differences between how men and women view the world." The one is that there's a cheerleading squad in law enforcement saying at every every shift briefing, "Here are the current threats against your life today." Uh, remember, fellas, weapons, vehicle safety, which in my team was always. Remember not to shoot your cars. <laughs> that was our weapons and safety briefing. Anyway, <clears throat> it is a con they are the the people who do the the lectures in law enforcement. The people who do the safety briefings in law enforcement um, are just hyping this up. For example, the reason that you know two officers who are killed per year on traffic stops make the, makes a traffic stop one of the deadliest things that officers ever get involved in. No, it doesn't. Far more deadly than that is fat cops. You know, the ones who drop fucking dead of heart attacks. To give you an idea, this year, two officers that have been killed, in the last year, two officers have been killed uh, on traffic stops by gunfire. One has been mauled to death by a bear. I don't think anyone's going to agree that there's a, a massive bear threat facing law enforcement. That's one of their greatest killers, even though it's right on par with, <laughs> with the, uh, the numbers who were killed <laughs> by guns on traffic stops. Now, speaking of which, on this responsibility issue, as I mentioned, men have all the same things to worry about their else does. I scan people's hands, I scan their waists, I do this even with my friends and my family, because uh, those are the ones who are most likely to hurt you. Everywhere I go, I carry this little puppy, and among other things. Uh, whenever I walk into a room, I instantly look for its exits. I know where the fire exits are. I do this as a matter of habit, and I do it without variation. I do it without failure. I do it every time. Because there are threats that do exist. I'm aware of these threats, and I take minor steps in the way of addressing them. Now, there are people who, uh, as, as I've mentioned, who want me dead. That is an additional level of threat I have to contend with, and I take that into account. So the fact that I carry a firearm everywhere I go does not suggest that uh, someone else who faces a lesser degree of threat that's more diffuse and not, not specific to them also should do that. They should, they should take, uh, take, consider carefully what it is that, that, uh, that they face and they should react to that. Not to my set of affairs, but to their set of affairs as, as best as they can determine it. Um, in law enforcement, um, a, a, there is well you can watch a lot of videos of cops being killed in law enforcement we do we do watch them a lot we study them this isn't the victim blame the person who's culpable for the murder is the murderer not that fact notwithstanding there are things that you can do to admit to hedge your bets 
So it works like this. It's not possible to, to guard against just bad luck. A stray bullet through the head is just as deadly as an aimed shot through the head. Uh, you know, if, it, if you get hit by it, you get hit by it. There's nothing you can do to stop it other than not being there. But if you'd known you were going to die, maybe you wouldn't have been there. So, I mean, you, just, you can't stop it. And in all cases, and given that it's impossible to prevent all of this, you have certain choices to make. And some choices will be good, and some choices will be bad. Uh, and we get to see the, the consequence of officers who have made bad choices play out on their video cameras that record their own murders. So one of, one of which is Kyle Dean Keller. Um, this officer, uh, if you watch the video, um, the, he, unlike his murderer, is poorly trained. His murderer, much better shot. Uh, his his murderer much uh, more precise. He shoots him in both arms, so he can't return fire. Shoots him in both legs, so he can't run away. And then he executes him. This officer is shooting, knocking out windows. I mean, if you were, if the if the murderer were made of a car window, he had a lot to fear from uh, Kyle Dean Keller, but he wasn't, and he didn't. The officer was a, a really shitty uh, shooter. Why? He failed to spend time on the range to to uh, to hone his skills. That is very unfortunate. It would have come in quite handy that day for him to actually been able to put uh, uh, fatal shots on target. He was unable to do that. He also apparently did not practice uh, controlling, uh, practice in stressful situations. He was unable to control his fear, and you could hear it in his voice and see it in his actions and how he was reacting and should not have been reacting. When he got shot, the first bullet that hit him was not fatal. It disabled him because he, he had not inured himself to the pain. This is a guy who has dreams of being a cop and going out and doing great things, but did not take seriously the threats that he would confront in that job. Most officers aren't killed not because they're so good at their jobs. They do it because people are reluctant to want to kill police officers. The greatest protection police officers have is the public's cooperation, the, public, the, the general goodness of, of the public. But there's a subset of, public, uh, of the public who aren't good. These are the predators. These are the hardened criminal types that you, you hear about in the news all the time. The FBI published a book several years, actually three of them, several years ago, which you can't read because it's for law enforcement only, so... <laughs> totally mature. Um, and it's called Violent Encounters. And they are examining, all these books are examining felonious uh, assaults and killings on officers. And the same way there are a lot of myths about feminism, there's a lot of myths about the competence of police officers with respect to their firearms. I hate to break it to you, most cops are incompetent at shooting. They're exceptionally poor shots. They will get uh, 15 hours, 16 hours of training in the academy, and then they will do one afternoon every year thereafter. This would be like saying, uh, believing that high school students who've, who've been graduated, who took uh, algebra in high school, are experts because they took three weeks of al uh, algebra, one hour per day, and then they uh, they do a couple, they try to do a couple of problems one Saturday every year. Well, criminals believe that officers are competent with the firearms too. So the successful criminals, the ones who are reliably killing officers, who are su successful at defeating the body armor, getting in the kill shot, uh, it turns out that, that they are practicing about 25 times more often than law enforcement. The criminals are the ones who are training, not the cops. The cops, once again, their actions are inconsistent with the claims about the hazards that they face. About uh, two-thirds of the officers who were killed are wearing body armor, the other third aren't. Now, sometimes you don't wear body armor because you're undercover and you've just got to accept that additional risk. A road officer should be fired if he does not have on his, his uh, bulletproof vest at all times. You should simply be dismissed from service. You're incompetent. <clears throat> Quite frankly, um, you are letting down your fellow officers by intentionally making yourself more vulnerable and therefore reducing the, the chances that you will be of use to the public or to your fellow officers. Because once you've been hitting your squishy spots, it's very easy for you to be down and out for the count, and then you're down a man who could have been useful uh, in, in the fight. But you have chosen to intentionally weaken yourself, and uh, you should be fired for it. So, <clears throat> And it, you're weakening yourself for no, no particular end, unlike in an undercover investigation where if you walk in, oh, got my bulletproof vest on, check. Sidearm, check. Running shoes, uh, good boots, check. Oh, you know what I need? I need my handcuffs and a spare set, spare set of handcuffs. And where's my tactical key? Where is, where's my asp? How did you guys know I'm a cop? Oh my god, you must be psychic. You know, obviously there are reasons there where you're going to be more vulnerable. That's why, anyway. 
Uh, so the actions there are just inconsistent. They'll wear these, uh, their chiefs will make them wear these stupid baseball caps that have a bill so when they do this they can't see half of their field of view. Uh, you know, so when, when they look down and the guys check in to see oh, how hard, gosh, how far away from your gun is your hand? And you know, when they start doing this, you aren't able to see the initial reach for the gun. You are at a disadvantage. Your chief has decided that your life is not worth dispensing with an absolutely useless and stupid item of clothing. These are just actions that are inconsistent with the claims, but they'll go into court and claim, oh no, we're under such that we need expanded powers to be able to stop and, and frisk people because it's fun. That's not why they, that's not actually what they say, but I'm mocking uh, that kind of stupidity. Um, when, when I was stabbed uh, right by the guy, uh, that did not, um, that, that's part of my lived experience, an issue about which Feminists talk so much. Women talk so much. Oh, the lived experiences of women. Fuck you. I don't care about the lived experiences of women. I care about data. The fact I've been stabbed uh, by a guy who wasn't white doesn't say, well, my lived experience with black people is they stabbed me. Oh, well, it's your lived experience. Go for it. Go be racist. No, it doesn't license that at all. You need to look at the actual data. And if you're not going to be driven by that, then you should just say, well, you know, I feel the way I feel and the way I feel is what I choose to believe. I don't care what the data says. So, mm. um, so there is uh, there is that. Um, I guess I'll leave it uh, about there, and then I'll do a response to your toxic masculinity video later, unless you do a response to this, in which case I might do that first. Have a good day.